So, uh, Anne, you're up again for AB 2021-268, and that's your presentation on the recommendations from the Homeless Strategies Work Group. Well, and I'm sorry that you have to see me twice. Um, so I have some documents that I will share again. Um, And does this one show up? Great. So when, so we were asked to um, help the Homeless Strategies Work Group uh, gather the information and the data needed so that they could make some recommendations to the County Council. And if you recall, uh, when you created the Homeless Strategies Work Group, their role was to look specifically at shelter opportunities. First and foremost, it was how to uh, create a 200 bed shelter that was accomplished. And then secondly, to look at other shelter options. And so uh, when we were putting together information to provide to the Homeless Strategies Work Group, we worked um, with the city on this, but we knew that the first part of a needs assessment is to look at what do we have currently in terms of shelters. And so this document shows all the different shelters that currently are in operation in Whatcom County. Some shelters are drop-in day-to-day, which is that third column from the right. And some of them are scheduled admissions. For instance, we have a number of specialty shelters as you'll see here. And these specialty shelters focus on specialty populations. So some work um, obviously with domestic violence, some with um, refugees, some with uh, people with serious mental illness, uh, some families with children. So as you go through this, and I won't go through all of this, but I just wanted you to know that this is what we do always, the first step for any particular needs assessment is to make sure we know what we have. And this helps us then identify, so what don't we have? Here you'll see that the total beds, and this is how we're uh, kind of counting the number of the capacity of our shelter. Uh, depending, uh, some of these shelters will take families. So depending on uh, how many are in a family, anywhere between 450 up to 516 beds are available on any given night in our community that are shelters. So first of all, any questions about that? All right, so then um, our next thing was to look at, so what are the identified needs and gaps? And this is really what we were trying to figure out, not only looking at the inventory, but also, again, a lot of the data collection, both the quantitative data that we do as part of our work, as well as some uh, interviews and qualitative data. And so the way I put this together was uh, really by population or issue, population wasn't always the most appropriate category. And then what information do we have about that? So in terms of needs and gaps, Families with children is at the top of this list. And uh, sadly, as you've heard already, uh, the COVID pandemic drove a number of families with children into homelessness. And at the time uh, we presented this to the Homeless Strategies Work Group, which was a couple weeks ago, um, 65 to 85 families with children were residing in motels. That was unheard of because not too long before that, we were at functional zero with families with children in homelessness. And we were feeling pretty good about our um, ability to do that. We have, uh, since this time, gotten a number of these families into permanent housing with some increased case management services and some rental assistance. So this number is lower, although I don't know what it is today, but we are continuing to get people into uh, our families with children into permanent housing, knowing that motels is really not the way to go, but better than um, being unsheltered. 
Another need we identified was the young adult population, 18 to 24. Sometimes um, they are more vulnerable, often more vulnerable, um, living unsheltered simply because of their age and their lack of experience, not to mention their um, brains aren't fully developed in terms of, you know, judgment and things like that. So we um, knew that last year we put together during the winter months an overnight shelter for young adults and approximately 20 young adults utilize that shelter. The other growing population in our homeless um, population is elderly women, sadly. I think I fall into this category. Elderly only. I am fortunate to have a place to live right now. But this um, has really been a, a concern for us. Again, a very vulnerable population. Uh, we did work with the YWCA to get some more shelter beds dedicated with some of the grant funding we got. So that has been helpful. And then the other um, we know is medically fragile, people who have significant disabilities or medical conditions that make them vulnerable to uh, living unsheltered. And then, of course, special populations at risk. This was something that we hadn't initially um, understood very well, but our homeless advocates have been very helpful in um, clarifying that there are some people who face a higher risk of harassment and even potential harm, um, and they would benefit from shelter opportunities that maybe don't mix with a larger population. Uh, LGBTQ, BIPOC, people with... Um, significant um, obvious disabilities are unfortunately targeted at times. And then um, number six is not a population so much, but an issue that we, as we were doing our um, work, uh, and obviously um, given the protests this uh, winter, there were a number of um, protests, but we also know that there are a number of small encampments already in place throughout the county and that access to waste removal, toilet facilities, et cetera, is limited. And so that was one issue that was significant. And then the other thing we learned with tiny homes is that, um, and it was interesting, I heard part of the um, discussion at the planning committee on tiny homes, but when we um, work with commerce or with HUD, we must meet certain conditions in order to qualify as a shelter. So when it comes to tiny homes, they actually um, need to have these criteria met to even be considered a shelter, not even housing, but just a shelter. They have to have the ability to adjust the living structure to the climate. So it has to have heat or an opening window if it's the middle of summer, a fan. Uh, they have to be a semi-permanent structure um, to prepare or eat food. So if not within that tiny home, then nearby, not just a tent. That doesn't really count. Uh, the living structure, the actual tiny home must have four walls, a ceiling and a door that closes. And um, reasonable access to sanitation facilities less than 100 yards away must be there, which is the ability to shower with hot and cold running water, toilets, you know, with... Um, uh, plumbing, and then electricity must be to the living unit. So we had a couple, um, we asked, we have two tiny home villages now uh, in our community, and Commerce told us they, quote, barely qualify as shelters because they don't have all of these things quite to the level they should. So for us, we also were looking at, okay, so if we invest in tiny homes, if we put public monies into this, they need to be at the level of qualifying as a shelter. And then um, what we also knew in our research is that local government may not be the answer to everything here. There are some types of shelter desired, and we've heard this in some of the homeless strategies work groups as well, where people wanted something that local government simply isn't going to be the provider uh, that we know that we need to identify humane responses to people living unsheltered, but that we may not be able to provide the type of shelter they want. Um, certainly, I know some of you have heard that some folks would prefer to just um, live the life they want, but maybe it's not one that the government could support. 
The other concern we had, which, you know, is fluctuating, but at the time we presented this to the Homeless Strategies Work Group, we know that there was significant underutilization of available shelters. This um, was incredibly troubling to us because we knew that some of that underutilization was a result of um, misinformation purposefully being distributed and that it discouraged people from using uh, the Lighthouse Mission Base Camp, for instance. Those people then um, maybe were in another type of encampment some of our case managers gave us uh, stories, basically horror stories of horrible abuse that happened for some of those who were most vulnerable, who had been doing really well when they were at base camp, when they were discouraged from being there, went to another camp, um, were assaulted, and um, it was pretty distressing for the case managers, not to mention those of us who try to make people's lives better. Another issue, and I know some of you have brought this up before, is methamphetamine use. This is one of our greatest challenges right now in the housing uh, program, not to mention just shelters. And that the use of methamphetamine, actually it contaminates buildings and it contaminates living units, it contaminates apartments. And um, for us, it's just... Uh, a, a terrible thing because it costs so much to uh, fix that damage, but also people under the influence of methamphetamine sometimes can become very aggressive, very volatile. Um, and again, law enforcement oftentimes needs to be called in or, or people are harmed as a result. Methamphetamine is a horrible drug. And then um, some other issues, this one um, you won't want to hear, but there are um, limited shelter opportunities in our county neighbor to the south of us. They did add some capacity uh, and that was good with their shelter grant, but they do not have a night by night quick access shelter like our base camp. And we, we know that um, there have been times when first responders have transported people up here to our uh, base camp or our lighthouse mission simply because it was available and they felt, you know, obligated to help people who are unsheltered get into shelter. But we, um, as a single county, uh, certainly we're not going to solve homelessness that is a national issue or a state issue or even a regional issue that we we are doing the best we can and still have plans to do more, but um, we really can't take other care of other counties' residents. We, we really want residents to be able to seek shelter in the counties they live in. And then finally, the point in time count did go on as planned. Although we weren't required to do outreach this time, our volunteers that did uh, participate wanted to do so. And so what we found is that um, the people living unsheltered actually mirrored this 2020 count. Uh, 218 were living unsheltered this year. Uh, but at that time, we also knew that that night there were about 100 or 80 vacancies in shelter spots. So uh, it looked like we actually had fewer people living unsheltered this year than we did the winter before. So we did the housing inventory, we did the needs and gaps. And now I'll go through the recommendations and are there any questions about this so far? Councilmember Brown. And you're on mute, council member. Yeah, sorry, I was digging. The 218 living in shoulder that was people who were not in base camp, not at the mission or other places, correct? Correct. What was the total count of unhoused? Homeless. So here is the point in time count data. Um, the, t the unsheltered is up at the top. And um, the first um, line is emergency shelter. The second one is transitional housing. The unsheltered here was um, folks that were living in uh, probably tents, 
right? So that so we've jumped from seven hundred and seven to eight hundred and sixty-two. Right. However, what we also knew is that at that time there were eighty vacancies in shelters, so the shelters were not being used. Right. But our overall homeless population has increased by about twenty percent. Uh, probably not that much. And again, this is raw, simple data. The report is coming out soon and it will explain things in much greater detail. So um, I don't think I'm prepared to do that right now, but there's a lot uh, a detail behind these numbers. And so then, um, so then these are the um, recommendations that the Homeless Strategies Work Group is providing to County Council, which was your request and your direction to the Homeless Strategies Work Group. And that um, you wanted this group to make recommendations relative to shelters. And um, this is that product. And you ask them to do it as expeditiously as possible or expediently as possible. I think the uh, COVID pandemic obviously created um, some additional challenges. So maybe this didn't come to you quite as expediently as it needed to. But we, this was really broken down into short term, meaning next winter. How, how do we make sure that these things are in place by next winter? And then some longer term goals that are maybe a one to three year prospect. So, uh, of course, overarching goals up at the top. But here are the recommendations. One is let's ensure that we continue to provide motel stays for families with children until we all get them back into some better permanent housing. And can I ask that real quick? Are, are those prioritized in, in the order that they're presented? No. Okay. It's good to know. No, we actually think we need to do all these things. And, and the good news is some of them are in process. The second one was, um, again, to establish an overflow winter shelter to offer individuals when base camp is full. We um, didn't need overflow this year, sadly, because um, uh, there was a protest and people didn't want to use base camp. But um, we would still provide this to make sure that when the months in, during the winter are extremely cold, that people still have additional space. So 30 additional spots. And that we would continue to establish severe weather shelters. What we know is that some people won't use base camp. They won't use the overflow shelter. But when it's particularly severe weather, even um, then we found that some of them were willing to use those severe weather shelters. So we still want to continue with that practice. Something that is ongoing but that we're going to beef up is establishing a data collection process to assist in ongoing analysis and planning. We need to make sure we really understand who is living unsheltered and what um, needs must be met in order to get them sheltered and eventually housed. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that um, we use the homeless outreach team to help gather some of that data. That will be really important. And um, to continue uh, supporting our specialty shelters. As we talked about, there are folks who have disabling conditions that make them um, too vulnerable even in a large shelter and that we need to continue to support the shelters that we have for those folks. The next one was support continuation of the current tiny home villages, as well as the pending one that is um, being funded by the city of Bellingham through Road to Home and the Low Income Housing Institute. But we also didn't, we really recommend against any further investments in the number of taxpayer supported um, home encampment sites until we do some more in-depth research to ensure that the need exists. Uh, we have to figure out besides just the misinformation and the vitriol that occurred last time and the lack of use of the current shelters, which uh, as you recall, the Homeless Strategies Work Group first priority was to develop that 200-bed shelter. But what is it that we really need to know? The trends in uh, shelters uh, are coming and going. Tiny homes was it for a while. Then buying motels was it for a while. 
uh, making sure that you can actually uh, staff a motel 24 seven to make sure that um, people are safe and the community around it is safe. It's very, very expensive. Um, and then again, there's other trends that come and go. So for us, rather than just leaping on the current one, we thought we need to be much more thoughtful about what is it that isn't provided that people are needing. And so we would not recommend any more tiny home purchases until we complete that work. And then um, again, we just want to encourage local elected officials to work with Skagit and Island counties to increase the shelter capacity for their residents because we want their residents to be served in their own home town or their own home county. So those are our short-term recommendations. And um, I will tell you that, uh, the, and I, you may have heard, but the state legislature did allocate a, a good chunk of money for construction and rehab to create that um, way station uh, at the State Street Health Department building that would provide the shelter for medically fragile. And so that was one of our goals. And it looks like that one has um, been uh, provided the opportunity to move forward. So that's a great opportunity. And then in terms of longer term, which is really the one to three year period, we are working actively right now with our community housing partners, as well as the city on developing some interim housing for families with children so that it's not permanent housing, but rather than motels, which are not the best option for them and um, are a bit more transient in nature, we really wanted to set up some interim housing units that could serve as an alternative and uh, make sure we had a place where they were stable enough that case managers could work with them on next steps, get them into permanent housing. Um, we also um, this established the shelter and services for people who are medically fragile. I just talked about that, but that's, um, that's on the road. And then of course, the other long-term is the relocation of base camp. They currently are in a leased building that will run out after a few years and we need to make sure that they can relocate to a permanent home and obviously working closely with the city on that because um, of zoning issues and other things like that. So those um, are the recommendations from the Homeless Strategies work group. They uh, fulfilled their directive relative to the uh, ordinance that you created or that created them. The question, of course, is so who's going to oversee that these recommendations are implemented? And the recommendation for that is that you um, task the Whatcom County Housing Advisory Committee with this work. The Housing Advisory Committee, if you recall, was set by interlocal agreement among the county and all seven cities. It has uh, three advocates on the committee. It has um, tribal nation representatives. It has housing developers. And then it also has small cities, city of Bellingham and county representation. So it has a lot of weight and influence. And their job is to oversee all aspects of homelessness services and housing. And they meet on a regular basis it's staffed by the health department and they uh, should be tasked with ensuring that these recommendations come forward uh, in terms of implementation and also that regular reports are provided to county council. So you know that the work is being monitored and is progressing forward. So those are the recommendations from the housing uh, strategies or the homeless strategies work group and I'll, Turn it back over to you, Barry, for questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Ann. Uh, let's start with questions and comments. We'll start with Councilmember Donovan. Um, that was a very comprehensive. Thanks for all that. What's the um, years left at the Cornwall base camp location? Three. Um. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't recall. It seems to me it was 
a three-year lease with a one-year option for extension, but it could be four with a five-year. But I think it's four I think years. It was, I, th I thought it was three with, with maybe one, but because that seems like yeah, we're already one year. And we're one year into it, that's coming up quicker than, than we thought. But um, I, I think the recommendation at the end to, to put it to a regular standing committee um, to put this body of work to the, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the housing. Housing standing. advisory committee. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a good plan. Councilman Brown? Deacon, you must have been reading my mind or I must have been reading yours because um, I, I, just before you started, I actually instructed the staff to send out a re draft resolution to, to make that very recommendation you've just said which hopefully the council will see this evening. But I completely agree with you. I think the, the work of the, um, uh, you know, we've, we've had the, the, full rec the final recommendations from the Homeless Strategies Work Group. And I, th I think the, um, the Housing Advisory Committee is the right one to then take forward and move this ball forward. So I guess one thing that we can do right now is, is we can, uh, uh, I would entertain a motion that we accept these recommendations. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the recommendations put forward by uh, the recommendations uh, that Ann just presented. D discussion? Councilmember Frazee? I, I would like to discuss. Um one of the recommendations, first of all, thank you for all this. It's very comprehensive and everyone who worked on it. Um, getting, getting Skagit and Island County on board, if you have any recommendations, maybe, maybe that's what you're going to bring forward to us, but um, to start that communication, whether it's a letter or something like that, um, we'd be open. I'd be open to hearing that. Maybe everyone else too, to get and them on board. I may ask the county exec to weigh in. I know he had talked about the Swiss as one um, potential avenue, but I'm not sure what all you have in place for communication with your colleagues in the region. Is he frozen or is he there? Oh, he's there. He's moving. <laughs> I don't know, Sapal, did you hear what Ann was did saying? You hear, did you hear what Ann asked you, Sapal? It's reading something else. I'm sorry. It was okay. another oh. urgent matter. Yes, please. Can you ask it again? I'm I'm sorry, Sapal. I, I may have thrown you under the bus, not on purpose, but there was a question about how um, a local elected officials would work with our neighboring counties on encouraging them to increase shelter capacity in their own communities. Yes. And I think you talked to me about Swiss and maybe there are other opportunities where those discussions could occur. Yes, I have actually already reached out to Skagit County. I had a good conversation with mayor of uh, Burlington and uh, they have ordered, I believe 70 tiny homes uh, from uh, uh, 360 modular, uh, they came and looked at ours and uh, they do that. And they were, of course, late for the last year session, but they have some planning and their county is planning to do some more work. Uh, I will follow up again uh, with, with the commissioners uh, that what they are doing countywide. I think the Mount Vernon, city of Mount Vernon is also participating and Burlington took the lead and they said, we'll provide this uh, space and we will invest money uh, for the tiny homes. But we need a shelter like a base camp type of a, a shelter for, for them to establish. So I offer them that we can provide you any help or guidance what we can. Councilmember Donovan. The yeah, one thing I'm curious about in the recommendations, um, is particularly after what Mr. Sadu said about um, our neighboring counties investing more in tiny homes, this sort of seems to say we're going to support what we have, but um, no further investments. Um, 
And I'm, I'm wondering, they seem to have a, a decent record of rehousing people. Um, so what, what, what is the hesitancy there? I think twofold. One, um, some of our uh, specialty shelters have a much higher success rate in housing people. Not that um, I, I think Homes Now has done an admirable job and I would not want to take anything away from them. But I do think that um, there are a number of people where, um, how shall I say this? I think Homes Now also screens who lives in their communities. And I think we're still looking at uh, some people who are not interested in living in a, a real structured place. And so for us to um, invest in tiny homes before we're clear about how we would do that, who would live there, and is that going to meet the needs? That's really what we were saying is don't jump to invest anymore until we've done more of our homework there. Because I'm not sure it's the answer for everyone. And, and we've got to figure out what that answer is. And some, like I said, some people who are homeless, uh, what they want is something that local government will not be providing. And so then we also have to find other communities, uh, programs that may be willing to offer something that the county can't support. So it's not, don't ever do it again. It's give us time to do our research. Other questions, comments? Mr. Brown. Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge we have with any of these alternatives is, is the mission or Homes Now or any of these groups is really not set up to deal with someone who engages in violent behavior or is an active user of meth. It, it is, it's just, and it's particularly difficult to combine those people with a vulnerable population who's either you know, a victim of previous victim of domestic violence or someone who's trying to get off meth. Um, you just can't, I just don't see any successful model of mixing those two populations together. Anything else? Maybe, Executive uh, Sadu. if I may, I just wanted to add that in addition to the way station, we started that planning uh, more than two years ago, but we were not, uh, hopeful that we will be able to get money so fast. And I think uh, I just want to commend the council that when we brought the plan to the council last year, that uh, we are working on this proposal and uh, council giving us the consent, which allowed us to, to participate in that application to the legislature. And there we are with $4 million. And, and I think this is giving a lot of excitement to uh, Peace South, all three partners, Opportunity Council, as well as uh, Unity Care, to, to, to uh, you know, carry on to bring this project to fruition. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I have been taking up, I just had a meeting with all the CEOs of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, affordable housing, you know, like uh, Cultural Land Trust, Mercy Housing, uh, Opportunity Council, uh, and I sat down with them to work out a strategy how in next five years we can make a difference. So one of the things we are trying to do is, is I met with, uh, then I had another meeting with the developers and landowners uh, and asking them how they can help uh, uh, the local community, local governments to increase the availability of, uh, of affordable housing. Uh, and of course, we passed 1590, uh, which will be helpful. And we are going to uh, see that how we can use some money from the EDI and maybe, maybe if possible, some money from American Rescue Plan to do that. So there are two categories. One is 60% and below AMI. And the other one is, is higher AMI, which goes up to 80% 220% AMI. So that's a workforce housing and this is low income housing. So, so we, when we say word affordable, uh, there is the shades of that in between. I know we cannot fight the uh, market to bring the uh, uh, 
prices lower for all housing, but I think we are taking steps, even if we can do 10% of the new developments housing and ask, uh, work with the uh, developers uh, on the new projects to allocate uh, uh, multifamily units or single family homes or combination of that duplexes, fourplexes, uh, uh, and bring them into this arena. And uh, all these uh, uh, CEOs of uh, nonprofit organization are very excited with this opportunity that they can then, if they can get that land uh, or that opportunity to participate in multifamily housing, then they can uh, put together the rest of the money from um, uh, state commerce, uh, Washington Housing Trust Fund, as well as the HUD or other federal sources, even WSDA has some money for these things. So we are looking at a very comprehensive overall plan. It just started. It will take us a few months to, to fine tune it, but I just wanted to uh, apprise the council where we are going with this uh, for, uh, we are developing a five-year plan, not just one season to the next season. So, so I just wanted to share with everybody. Thank you. Councilmember Ellenboss. So a yes vote here would be a vote to accept the recommendations, just that, accept them. It's not a vote to implement them. It's actually, to, yes, to what you said, but it, it's a recommendation to the full council. We vote on this again tonight. Maybe I missed it. Is there funding associated with it? Um, council member, this is Ann Deacon. We, um, by sending these recommendations, basically directing the Housing Advisory Committee to um, hold accountable the implementation of these recommendations, the Housing Advisory Committee is going to have to figure out the funding issues. Some of the recommendations and uh, projects are already underway and funding has been identified. Um, in other places, if there's funding that can't be identified, we'd probably be coming back to the council to talking about that. But um, I, I think that the overall strategic plan for how to get all of this going um, would come to you from the Housing Advisory Committee. But yeah. I will say we already have funding in place that covers some of these things. So uh, hopefully that would help. Uh, I was gonna add this, well, what uh, Ann has said that, uh, uh, that this will be as the projects develop, we are giving them, these are the priorities or these are the recommendations. And once the Housing Advisory Committee starts bringing up the projects or match them to the projects, these recommendations, and then we will get the request for funding and, and they may be reaching out for that funding themselves. And we, uh, we and, and city of Bellingham would be the uh, uh, sporting organizations helping their applications, or in some cases, we may be providing funding from our sources. Like I mentioned, American Rescue Plan, which is over three years, and the 1590, the funds approved by the uh, council uh, uh, recently, as well as EDI funds. So we are not just throwing it, here is the recommendation and here's so many million dollars. Uh, that's not our intent. Our intent is that these are the recommendations, come up with plans to meet these recommendations, implement these recommendations and piece by piece over time. This is not something we can accomplish in one or two years. I am thinking, you know, maybe between one and five years, step by step, but we will be uh, looking forward to seeing their needs for money and, uh, and match the sources with that. And some of those funds will be from our local funds and uh, will be coming to the council for that. Councilmember Ellenboss? Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I'm probably going to vote no on this, but it's not because I don't think it's a good plan. Pro I just... I, I want to see the, the funding sources before I start voting yes on stuff. Councilmember Brown? 
Yeah, um, Councilmember Alamos, I, I understand the concern. I think this is just setting the priorities for them to go out and secure the funding. The, the, the actual approval of the funding uh, would actually be something that would come back to the council at a later date once those sources have been identified. So um, I think there's, there's a considerable amount of transparency that will happen in the future and a considerable amount of opportunity to actually vote yay or nay to approve any individual program and its funding. But we have to set the priorities first. Right. But that, and that, I guess that's what I meant when I said voting yes on this would be accepting the plan, not implementing the plan, because it, it might be a good plan, but if it comes at the costs, you know, of other programs or too much, too many dollars, well, then it's not a good plan. So see what I'm getting at there. So I, I would vote to accept it. I don't want to vote to implement it. And, no, think, and, and that, that vote happens later with, with a lot more detail. Yeah, I, th I think the, you're, you've got it right on the head, Ben, just the word accept. Uh, that's that's what I that's what I think uh, Councilmember Donovan's motion was. Is that correct, Mr. Donovan? That's correct. Any further discussion? Okay, please call the roll. Tyler Bird, I believe is not has not joined the meeting. Todd Donovan. Yes. Ben Ellenboss? Yes, I accept it. Carol Frazee? Yes. Kathy Kirshner? Rod Brown? Yes. Barry Buchanan? That, pass, that passes, uh, let's see, what do I have? Six to zero uh, with Councilmember Bird. Uh, Absent. No, six five to zero. With Councilmember Bird and Kirshner absent. You are muted in your vote, Barry. I voted yes. So that is uh, five to zero to one. Uh, five to zero with two council members absent. Any other? Anything else for the committee of the whole? Barry, this is Dana. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to confirm about the resolution that Red mentioned earlier. Was that something that's going to be added to tonight's meeting or? That was my intent. It's up to Barry to decide as a chair, but that was my intent. Yeah, I think that was the intent. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, we'll see you at six. We are adjourned.